Okay, starting with this lecture, we start a new topic, although it's quite connected to the previous topic, it's a slightly different topic. So, we have been looking at orthogonal polynomials, we looked at several properties. In this set of lectures, which are st starting from uh, this one, we will look at Bessel functions, which are, you know, they have properties sort of similar to orthogonal polynomials, except that they are not polynomials. Right, so we will define Bessel functions with the help of a series expansion and look at various properties. Right, so like with um, orthogonal polynomials, we will work out the differential equation as we go along, rather than you know start with the differential equation and then work out properties. Okay, so the Bessel function is uh, you know can be defined as with the aid of this convergent series. Right, so a Bessel function. Uh, of order nu is defined like here. So, it is this infinite series r going all the way from 0 to infinity minus 1 to the r divided by r factorial nu plus r the whole factorial times x by 2 to the whole power nu plus 2 r, right. So, so now nu can be non-integral in, in general, right. So, for our purposes, we will we will take x to be a real variable, right? So it's uh, uh, you know generalizations in, 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 in where complex variables are allowed are also possible, and many of these properties can be you know uh, worked out with great uh, you know there's a lot of beauty associated with this. But for, we will restrict ourselves to real uh, variables, and we will work out some properties of Bessel functions. Now. So this series, this definition allows for nu to be non-integral values. And so we have to make sense of this factorial, right? So we have a factorial sitting here, r factorial is all right, there's no issue. But if nu plus r, the whole factorial must be a, you know, sensible idea, we must make use of the generalized notion of the factorial function, which perhaps some of you are familiar with, but let's sort of, uh, use this opportunity to discuss the gamma function. So the gamma function is defined as this integral, right? So which again, you know, one can bring in a complex variable treatment of it, you know, define gamma in terms of as a function of a complex variable. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, very interesting mathematics, you know, to work out the uh, properties of the complex function. But for our purposes, we'll keep it simple. So let's think of the gamma function as this, as this integral where x is some real variable and so this integral goes from 0 to infinity, t is this dummy variable, t to the x minus 1 times e to the minus t dt. So why are we talking about the gamma function when we want to, you know, come up with an idea to generalize this factorial function, right? So we will see that in fact the gamma function is a kind of a factorial function. So in fact we, we could define x factorial where x is an arbitrary real number. In fact, this can be extended to also complex numbers. So, but x factorial can be defined as gamma of x plus 1, right? So, the way to see this is, uh, you know, first of all, we can argue that whenever x is an integer, positive integer, it will reduce to our familiar notion of, of a factorial. And also, we will see how, you know, a key property that the factorial function uh, satisfies holds even for you know when, when this extension is made. So to see this we will just integrate by part. So x factorial is defined as gamma of x plus 1 which is the same as this integral from 0 to infinity t to the x times e to the minus t dt. Right? So in, we are looking at x plus 1 so this has become t to the x. Now if you integrate by parts so e to the minus t is the, the uh, uh, the function whose integral we know, it's just minus e to the minus t. So that comes out first. So minus t to the x e to the minus t from 0 to infinity plus, because there is this minus sign, so that becomes a plus. When you differentiate t to the x, you get x times t to the x minus 1. So 0 to infinity t to the x minus 1 e to the minus t dt. And then we argue that, you know, at the lower end, so this is going to vanish and at the higher end, this quantity is going to vanish. So basically this boundary term is 0 at both ends. So basically, 
this x factorial is equal to gamma of x plus 1 and then we you know read off from here that you know this is really nothing but gamma of x. So, x factorial is seen to be gamma x times gamma of x, but gamma of x according to this definition is x minus 1 factorial. So, in fact, we have this you know uh, result that x factorial is equal to x times x minus factorial when it is defined in this manner and so this is basically how factorials uh, behave right. So, therefore, it is a very reasonable definition and we can also quickly check that in fact uh, whenever x is an integer a positive integer you know and factorial according to this rule will become n into n minus 1 factorial which in turn can be written as n into n minus 1 into n minus 2 factorial so on all the way up to 1 and then 1 itself uh, 1 factorial itself can be written as 1 times 0 factorial. Now, 0 factorial if we plug in into this definition is nothing but gamma of 0 plus 1 which is gamma 1 which is just this integral 0 to infinity e to the minus t dt which is seen to be 1. So, 0 factorial is 1. So, we recover exactly what we have for the factorial of a positive integer which is just n factorial is just n into n minus 1 into n minus 2 all the way down to 1. Okay, that is all good and so there is this particularly important case of a half integer. When, whenever you have a half integer, uh, I mean if you have gamma of n by 2 where n is some positive integer that you can write it as in terms of uh, you know gamma of n minus 1 by 2 which in turn you can write it as in terms of gamma of uh, um, so uh, n by 2 minus 1 then n by 2 minus 2 and so on. So, eventually you will come down to gamma of a half. So, we will work out this very special uh, integral which is gamma of half which is connected to Gaussian integral. So, it is important to uh, you know it is it's a result that one should remember gamma of half we will work it out now integral from 0 to infinity t to the minus a half e to the minus t dt is connected to the standard Gaussian integral which can be seen by making this substitution in place of t you put t equal to x squared and gamma of half is 0 to infinity. So, t to the minus a half will become x squared to the minus a half which is uh, x to the minus 1, but then you when you do dt you get 2x dx. So, the x will cancel and then you are just left with 2 times e to the minus x squared dx. But 2 to the times e to the minus x squared dx might you can might as well write it as from minus infinity to plus infinity this function is an even function. So, you can write this as you know in place of 2 times this integral from 0 to infinity is the same as going from minus infinity to plus infinity this Gaussian integral we know this result to be just square root of pi right. So, therefore, gamma of half is square root of pi and so this sort of detour into a discussion of the gamma function allows us to treat the Bessel function with index nu equal to half which is also a special case and which we can actually work it out in, in terms of a familiar function right. So, let us look at what is j half of x. So, by plugging in this series expansion. So, we have the series and uh, so in place of nu I have put half. So, that appears here and this appears here and so now first thing to observe here is you know there is this ratio test. So, if you take the, the ratio of successive terms, so you get you know this result and take the limit of r going to infinity. So, this goes to 0. So, basically this tells us that this is an absolutely convergent series right. So, which is I mean which is a fact that I already sort of mentioned, but here for this particular case uh, you can check by you know for using the ratio test and this can also be used to check the convergence for other news as well. So, in fact, it is not only uh, uniform absolutely convergent, but in fact the Bessel functions the series is in fact uniformly convergent. What it means I will not get into the details of how the argument works. Basically, what it means is you know in a neighborhood uh, x you know j, j nu of x is a function of x. So, if, you, if it is convergent at a point it is going to be convergent in a whole neighborhood around that point in basically the same way right in the sense of you know you can get as close to the value that you want uh, the, the, the function is going to converge to you know by truncating it at a higher level. And so, that truncation can be done in a sort of a uniform way 
if you are in some neighborhood around that point. So essentially what it implies is that you can you know take derivatives of such a, such a function and then take do term by term differentiation you can do term by term integration and so on. So this is true in general for any new not just new equal to half but we sort of check this ratio test with for new equal to half and then let us see uh, you know I, I said that j half of x is special so let us look at this. So we have this result r plus half the whole factor from our earlier discussion of the gamma function uh, is just r plus half times r minus half times all the way down to gamma of half. So uh, which is nothing but gamma of half is square root of pi. So and then we pull out these twos and then we re rewrite uh, the numerator as 2 r plus 1 times 2 r minus 1 so on all the way up to 1. So all the odd numbers from 1 to 2 r plus 1 are covered and the denominator is 2 to the r plus 1 as you can check there is the square root of pi hanging around. So what we can do is you know fill in these gaps in the numerator. So you can put a 2 r plus 2 then you can put a 2 r, uh, 2 r minus 2, uh, 2 r there is no 2 r plus 2 but 2, 2 r. Uh, 2r, 2r minus 2, so on, all the even numbers all the way down to 2. And then divide by the same stuff in the denominator, which you can you can check, you can pull out all those uh, you know twos in the denominator, and so you will be left with just this r factorial as far as the denominator is concerned, but you also have a 2 to the r, right? So every one of those r numbers will give you a factor of 2. So you have a 2 to the r, which you can combine to write it as 2 to the 2r plus 1 in the denominator. So basically r plus a half the whole factorial is the same as this whole stuff times square root of pi, right. And so in our expression for uh, you know we have this expression so we, if we multiply throughout with square root of x by 2 you will see in a moment why we are doing this. So if we do this and then we can rewrite this r plus half factorial in terms of this whole stuff. So you get this 2 r plus 1 whole factorial. And then there are all these cancellations you get a 1 over square root pi and then because you have multiplied by square root of x by 2 you get you know uh, so this half will become 1 so then you get an x to the 2 r plus 1 and then you can check that all of these cancellations allow you to rewrite the series in this form which is actually a familiar series minus 1 to the r divided by 2 r plus 1 the whole factorial r going from 0 to infinity times I mean there is also this x to the 2 r plus 1. So which is a familiar series it is nothing but the series expansion for sin of x. So what this tells us is square root of x by 2 times j half of x is actually nothing but sin of x divided by square root pi. So this particular function is is very special. So let us just quickly look at some, some plots of Bessel functions. So you know in particular if I look at this Bessel function plot for uh, when mu is equal to half you see all these oscillations and there is a decay right. So often Bessel functions show up whenever there is oscillatory behavior but also there is some kind of decaying behavior they appear in all kinds of contexts very familiarly uh, encountered in physical problems. So it is definitely worth being familiar with some of these properties of Bessel functions. So we can check that if you multiply by square root of x by 2 and then look at this plot it looks you know. Uh, perfectly periodic and there is no decay and in fact if we uh, super, super or if we plot simultaneously on the same graph also sin of x divided by square root of pi we see that the two curves overlap you do not see any distinction between the two. So indeed as you uh, we have derived you know how these two are the same so we can plot them and we check that indeed they are the same. So they also have this uh, you know way of looking at what Bessel function. So you can also uh, take negative values for nu. So you see that as you change nu Bessel function you know tends to remain basically a periodic kind of function there are there is oscillatory behavior but with also decay right. So you see uh, you know as you change nu there is this kind of structural change. So this is just a sort of a broad you know, look at what Bessel functions are, we will look at more properties in the following lectures. Thank you.